to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the young evangelist Titus, Paul said, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you may set in order the things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city. Titus chapter 1, verse number 5. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Titus and Philemon. We're so glad that you've joined us, and we want to encourage you, if, if you don't have your Bible out and ready, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible, get it, have it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. Friend, our lesson today, as always, is being brought to you by individual congregations and members of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be for worship on Sunday morning or Sunday night, or you'd like to come to their Wednesday Bible study, you will find people at the local congregation of the Lord's Church in your area who love God, who are concerned about others, and who want to help men and women go to heaven. And so check out the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your local area. If you've got a Bible question, maybe you've been thinking about some issue related to Scripture, maybe on salvation, maybe on worship, or maybe a moral issue, friend, we'd love to help you with that as well. Contact us at the Gospel of Christ. You can contact us at the information given during this broadcast, or you can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Contact us through that as well. And while you're on our website, thegospelofchrist.com, be sure and check out all our uh, study tools and resources available there. We've got video, we've got audio lessons, we've got written lessons, transcripts, study questions, just a wide variety of good Bible study material, and it's all available free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of our study on 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus and Philemon, or any book of the Old Testament or New Testament, we make that available free of charge to you. Go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Go to our media request form. You can fill that out. If you'd like to have a digital download, we can send that to you immediately. Or if you need a CD to listen to or a DVD as well, we can put that in the mail. We'll even pay the postage to take care of that. And as always, we encourage folks in our fast-paced world to stay up to date with notifications, uh, new things we're putting out, all our study material in the respective Apple and uh, iPhone app stores, uh, Apple iStore and the Google Play Store. You can download the Gospel of Christ app as well. Let's think today about the message of the book of Titus and Philemon. Why did Paul write to the young evangelist Titus and what is it he's trying to get Titus to understand? Notice the purpose of this book is so clearly mentioned in Titus 1 verse 5. Paul says this, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And so what's Titus all about? Paul needs Titus to put some things in order. There are some things that are not arranged maybe or some things people don't understand or problems maybe they're having in Crete. And Paul's going to address those and a big part as well to appoint elders in every city. Every city would have a congregation. So elders in every congregation. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 and 22. Now, we're not going to deal with the idea of elders today because in our second lesson on 1 Timothy, we dealt with that from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 in detail. If you'd like to learn more about the qualifications, check out that lesson as well. But as we think today about the book of Titus. Friend, there are some very practical and very encouraging lessons that we learn that help us to keep our lives arranged in order like God wants us to. What are some of those lessons? From Titus chapter 1 verse 2, we learn a powerful lesson about God, that God is truth and that He does not lie. 
Notice Titus chapter 1, verse number 2. The Bible says we are living in hope of eternal life. Watch this now. Which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Friend, the hope of heaven, the promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Where's the surety in that? The God who promised it. Himself is the surety. He cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Hebrews 6, 18. He is the absolute essence of truth. John 1, verse 17. And He is without error or sin or lies. His character is the affirmation of our hope and of our joy in Jesus Christ. And friend, here's how that's so practical. When God talks about heaven, when God talks about salvation, when God tells us we've been freed from sin, you can take that to the bank because God, it is impossible for God to lie. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 18. Well, what else does Paul want Titus to set in order? Some things he wants them to arrange in his mind and the mind of people in the, on the island of Crete. Friend, one of the things Paul clearly tells Titus is false teachers and false teaching has got to be put to a stop. Look at first or Titus chapter 1, verse number 11. Of these false teachers, Paul says to Titus, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert, subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. In the book of 1 Timothy, Timothy is taught to watch out for those who give in to genealogies and wives' tales and things like that. 1 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 7. We're not to listen to those who've got itching ears and they want to heap up for themselves their own teachers. Rather, we're to stay with the truth. And so people who are teaching error, Romans 16, 17 says we've got to mark them, we've got to note them because they're teaching things contrary to the doctrine of Christ and ultimately that's going to cause people to be lost. And so those wolves in sheep's clothing that Jesus described, they're still wolves. Their ideas and doctrines are devourous and we've got to make sure that we don't let people, and I'm not talking about me, and Paul is not saying you've got to be mean or unkind or use physical, that's not the idea. We stop them with the truth. We contend earnestly for the faith, Jude verse 3. We expose that which is darkness with light, John 8 verse 12, Ephesians 5 11, and we preach the truth in love, Ephesians 4 verse number 15. Then from the book of Titus, we also learn the importance that goes right along with that idea of preaching and teaching sound doctrine. Not only must we not listen to false teachers, we need to very carefully and attentively hear the truth preached. Notice Titus chapter 2, verse number 1. Paul says to Titus, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. That idea of sound is, is well or, or, or healthy. Doctrine that promotes good spiritual well-being. That's the kind of doctrine we need. The doctrine of Christ, John 7, 17, which came from God. The doctrine uh, that is good and wholesome and upright. That which promotes godliness, as the Bible will multi multiple times mention. And thus, just like Paul's warning to Timothy, preach the word, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach sound doctrine, Titus 2, verse 1, just like when God said to Jonah in the long ago, in Jonah 3, verses 1 and 2, preach the preaching I tell you. Friend, that's what we've got to focus on today. We need to preach the word. We need to back it up with a thus saith the Lord. And we always want to ask the question, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, 17, or what does the Scripture say? Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. In the book of Titus, Paul will give some various commands to all ages, younger women, older women, younger men, older men, and, and each of them are given definite guidelines and things they need to do and submit to in their lives. Look at Titus chapter 2, and I want you to notice beginning in verse number 2. The older men are to be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, 
and in patience. The older women likewise, reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women. Love their husbands, love their children, be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, the young men, be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, uh, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is the opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Each of these age groups, older men, reverent, temperate, sound mind, older women along those same lines, younger women, Focus on the family, focus on the children, be obedient to your husbands, the younger men, be a good example, live with integrity. You know, at each stage of one's life, we have certain things we can influence and focus on and emphasize and do great good in God's church. And that's what Paul is telling the young evangelist Titus here to do. But then toward the close of chapter 2, we find a beautiful passage about two amazing things, God's amazing grace and God's amazing people. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Paul says this to Titus, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify Himself, His own special people, zealous for good works. Friend, when I think about those two amazing things, God's amazing grace, you know, we sing that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And friend, that, that grace is powerful. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, teaches us to live soberly, righteously. When I understand the grace of God, grace is not a license to sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Romans 6 verse 1, grace teaches us. When I contemplate how undeserving I was of the gift of God's own Son, friend, that, that motivates me to live a life that's holy and pure and right. That motivates me to deny the things of myself that are not good. And then look at that second amazing thing. So that he would create for himself, listen to these words, his own peculiar or special people, zealous for good works. God's amazing grace made an amazing people. His own special people. And what are we? We are zealous. We are white hot. We are boiling over is the idea for good works. We are not a people who are, are pew potatoes. We're not a people who are just sitting around waiting for things to happen. We're a people of action because of what God has done for us. We want to get out and do God's work, spread His love, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, and live an exemplary life where people can see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. 1 Timothy chapter or excuse me, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 16. And then let's think about Titus chapter 3. What are some things that Paul wants to remind the church in Crete and the young evangelist Titus about from chapter 3? First, and this is a hard one sometimes, Christians are obligated as much as we can to submit to the governing authorities. Look in Titus chapter 3, verse number 1. Paul says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Romans 13 tells us specifically to obey the governing authorities. Christians are a people who need to obey the law. We need to follow the laws of the land. We need to pay our taxes. Matthew 22, 21, we need to honor the government or the king. 1 Peter 2, verse 13. Christians cannot be a lawless people who are going against every law of the land even when that law does not violate the law of God. And so as much as I can, and I can, I need to obey the laws of the land. Now, 
<coughs> if there is ever a time when the laws of the land violate the laws of God, Acts 5.29 says we ought to obey God rather than man. And while that on occasion morally will come up, for the most part, Christians are able and should obey the laws of the land, pay their taxes, be good, honest, upright, upstanding citizens. And so when you think about Titus 3, he begins by reminding us of our influence in the world around us and how we need to make sure that we stay true to God and His will and never, never ever allow that to cause us to be a difficult or a person who can't focus on what's right in this life. Then he reminds the Christians in Crete that they need to think about the kindness, the love, and mercy of God in their salvation. Would you look with me in Titus chapter 3? I want you to look in verses 4 and 5. Notice what Paul here says. The Bible says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, which He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Think about these words. <laughs> when the kindness and the love of our Savior appeared. When you think about the kindness of Jesus, what comes to your mind? I can't help but think about Jesus healing those who are sick. Uh, Jairus, when he'd lost his, his child, uh, the woman with the flow of blood. I can't help but think about uh, Jesus healing those who were downtrodden, the leper or the man who was born uh, lame, feeding the multitudes, casting the demon out of legion. Kindness is exhibited so wonderfully in the life of Jesus, the love of our Savior toward man. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that he was willing to come to this earth. And then think about the mercy of God. By his mercy we are saved. Lamentations 3 verse 20 through 22, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because they are new every morning. God's mercy, when he allows us to escape what we do deserve. Christians have got to contemplate. Friend, if, if I'm going to stay focused and really think about what I need to think about, stay on the mission I need to stay on. Think about the kindness of Jesus, the love of God, and the mercy of God toward you. Where would you be without God's kindness, love, and His mercy? And then, of course, he says that's through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That terminology, washing of regeneration, is kind of the idea of the new birth and that which is renewed in us by the Holy Spirit of God when we bring His Word into our life. And of course, those ideas are mentioned in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Jesus said, Alas, a man is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, uh, Born again. How can a man be born again when he's old? Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. I've got to be born by water means that I've got to be born again through the waters of baptism, I become a new creature. I am cleansed of sin, Acts 22, 16, Acts 2, 38, and born of the Spirit. My life is changed as I bring the, the fruit of the Spirit and the words of the Holy Spirit into my life that make me a new creature each and every day. And so this passage emphasizes God's work in our life when we obey the gospel and when we continue to live like God wants us to live. Now, there's another thing I want you to see from Titus chapter 3. I want you to look in verse number 14 with me. And, and here Paul reminds these Christians in Crete, and he reminds Titus that Christianity is not a one and done. Christian sanity is something you've got to continually maintain all your life. Look at Titus chapter 3. In some of the closing words, Paul says this in verse number 14. Let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Who, who are our people? Christians. Paul says to Titus, let our people meet, our, let them maintain good works, meet urgent needs. From being a Christian means that I'm going to strive to maintain. I'm going to strive to keep 
doing good works, meeting urgent needs, helping those who are downtrodden, encouraging those who are in need of that, doing good to all men. But you've got to maintain that. You know, when I think of maintaining something, let's say, just think about it this way. Let's say you've got a flower bed and you plant, you lay down the mulch and you've got the flowers and you plant those in there. A little bit of warm weather, a little bit of rain, a little bit of sunshine, and before long, weeds are going to pop up. How are you going to keep that flower bed looking good? You've got to maintain it. I mean, you've got to keep working on it. You're pulling the weeds, taking out what doesn't need to be out, putting in, taking care of what does need to be there. That's a picture of my life and yours. I've got to maintain that. I've got to take out, continually be watching and taking out what doesn't need to pop up. And it does pop up from time to time. And I've got to keep putting in and feeding and taking care of that which is essential in my life. All right, let's then think for just a few moments about the book of Philemon. Philemon is all about mending broken relationships. Uh, history records for us that in the Roman era, there were some estimated 60 million slaves. And these slaves are not like we think of in the uh, Civil War era. That's not necessarily, it's not forced slavery. In fact, a lot of times slaves had it better than free people in the Roman era. For example, if a man or a family were to fall on hard times, he could willingly sell himself into service as a servant or a slave to someone of wealth or means. And that person would take care of them, house, feed, give them every need. Oftentimes they were rewarded highly and sometimes they even became like family members. And so when we talk about slavery, we're not talking about Civil War slavery, but there was a problem between a servant and his master here. Onesimus is the servant of the slave. He is a runaway slave of a man by the name of Philemon. Evidently, he got tired of being a slave. And so he ran to Rome where he could get lost in the crowd. And in the process of doing that, Onesimus was reported and he got caught. And he, like many slaves who were caught, had that big F branded on their head, fugitivus. And thus, anybody who would see him would know that man was a runaway slave. But here's what's interesting about it. you got to see the providence of God in the book of Philemon. So Onesimus, a runaway slave, Philemon puts an APB out. They catch him in Rome. He is taken in by the law. He is put in a prison cell. And guess who's in that cell? None other than the Apostle Paul. Philemon's a Christian. Paul's a Christian. Philemon's a runaway slave. And guess who converts him to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul said, I've converted him. I have made him a son while in here. And thus that Onesimus, who did something bad, ran away, broke the law, stole money and work from Philemon, is converted to the truth. But Philemon still has some pretty hard feelings. Onesimus stole from him. Onesimus lied to him. Onesimus broke the law. There's a hard feeling and hard relationship there. And so Paul writes this letter back to Philemon reminding him the path to reconciliation requires you to take the initiative. It requires that you recognize you were once in sin and lost also. It requires that we have the, the courage to do what God wants us to do. And so he gives Philemon five things he can do to make reconciliation or needs to do. First of all, be thankful. You know, I've got to be thankful in this whole situation. I'm, I'm thankful for Paul and I'm thankful that Onesimus obeyed the gospel. Did this bad situation, were it not to happen? What about Onesimus' salvation? You know, Paul begins by being thankful for Philemon and we need to be thankful as well. Paul begins by praying for them. If you're sincerely trying to reconcile with someone, it's hard to pray for them and do the opposite of what God and His Word says. Paul is reminded of, of Philemon's love and his faith toward Jesus Christ, his Christian effort and his Christian influence as well. But then Paul makes an appeal for Onesimus' reconciliation to Philemon and vice versa. Listen to Philemon verses 8 through 16. 
Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I appeal to you, being such one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who was once unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart. And then, of course, Paul will say in verse 15, for perhaps Perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, more than a slave, a beloved brother in Christ. We don't always understand why things happen like they do. But you know, in this scenario, if you were in Philemon's situation, you would feel slighted as well. You would be angry. You would feel like you had been stolen from and wronged. But you know, when you stop and you look about everything that happened, it all worked out for Onesimus' benefit, for Paul's benefit, and ultimately for Philemon's benefit. How? Think about the three people involved in this. Paul received encouragement and help from Onesimus while he was in prison. Onesimus benefited the most in this in that he ran into the apostle Paul and was taught the gospel and became a Christian. And then Philemon benefits. How? Philemon gets his servant or slave back. No longer as a slave or servant. He's a brother in Christ. What a great relationship those two can now have in Jesus. And so Paul is appealing to Philemon. And friend, the practical lesson is this. Sometimes relationships are broken with people. Sometimes people have falling outs. Sometimes that happens even among Christians. Friend, we've got to realize reconciliation has got to take place based on the good of others. It's got to take place based on the Spirit of Christ and the good. That The more good we can do together than we can apart. And that's one of the powerful lessons that we find in the book of Philemon. And so all, as always, friend, we're glad that you've joined us for our study today. Uh, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you've never become a child of God, we'd love to help you with that. Contact us. We'd be glad to sit down and visit with you about the idea of salvation, what you need to do to become a Christian. And as always, we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area and watch our broadcast next time as we're going to study more from the gospel of Christ. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.